The following is a hoop ball presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. It's a mad dash today, ladies and gentlemen. Fantasy NBA Today. It's Monday, start of the week. Lots of things to do. Lots of things to do. I am Dan Vaspris. This is a hoop ball and Hawaiian Isles Kona Coffee presentation. Hawaiian Isles. The Hawaiian Isles. Man, that's where I want to be right now. God, I want to be in Hawaii right now. Um, Not that West LA is all that bad. I guess I should temper here. Be- my beef at the moment is the Lakers... I know this isn't my Lakers podcast, but good Lord. First, the Ty Lue thing falls apart. Then Jason Kidd's got to be a thing. Now he's the assistant coach under Frank Vogel. Thing is, if you had told me like four months ago, the Lakers would end up with Frank Vogel as a head coach for this coming season, I probably would have said, meh, you know, six and one, half dozen kind of thing. But the way they got there, just atrocious. And then all of a sudden now, being a Laker fan is really weird. <laughs> Kyrie Irving apparently is on the table after the way Boston got just smashed by the Milwaukee Bucks. You know, he doesn't want to be the lead dog anymore. If Boston brings in another superstar via trade, does that get Kyrie back? Man, I don't know. I mean, we could get into all that stuff, but what what difference is it going to make? I don't know where any of these guys are going to end up. I just have feelings, and my feelings mean nothing. There was a stretch earlier this year when KD and the Warriors were having their beef that I thought maybe he was going to go to the Lakers. I don't think so anymore. Seems like KD is almost for sure going to New York or staying in Golden State. Uh, Kawhi Leonard, I don't know. Incredible buzzer beater for Kawhi to knock out the 76ers. Keep that game from going to overtime. And Raptors advance to the conference finals in the eastern side of the bracket. So does that mean with the success he's having in Toronto, a lot of it is personal, though. A lot of it's personal success. Does he want to continue that? Or is he a guy that likes to bounce from place to place? Does he end up with, say, the Clippers? Where does Kyrie go? All these questions will be answered, but I won't be the one to answer them. So anyway, welcome to the show. The reason I was talking about Hawaii is uh, obviously, of course, Hawaiian Isles at Hawaiian at H.I. Kona Coffee on Twitter. HawaiianIsles.com is the website. Hawaiian Isles on Amazon. Uh, Hawaii is amazing. Their coffee is amazing. Hawaiian Isles. The being a Laker fan is uh, an emotional roller coaster, and I don't have the bandwidth for it but luckily I have the bandwidth for other things and that's what's coming up on today's podcast number one we're going to talk a little bit about what just happened in the playoffs over the weekend we had an opportunity for three game sevens on Sunday that didn't shake out and today is the beginning of post-mortem month and a half here at hoop ball you've already seen the article come out the written one Solomon or uh, at Nick Stradamus on Twitter put out the written edition of the Knicks postmortem from this most recent season. We're going to knock that out here on the podcast today. And we're going to work our way through every single team in the NBA starting today over the next six weeks, five teams a week. No shows, no articles on the weekends about these particular things, I should say. And we're going to work our way through the teams from worst record to best record in the NBA. There may even be, and this is a sort of aside, there may even be a little bit of math thrown in every now and again, but that's the way it's going to go. So regardless of who you've got hosting the podcast, and you got me solo today because uh, yesterday was Mother's Day, finally my schedule is going to settle down. I've really missed talking to Ethan. I feel like such a jerk, but my schedule just hasn't allowed recording over the weekend, and that's when we'd have to do it. I, I haven't been able to do it. It's on me, 100% on me. Uh, we'll have Neil Rochelani. He and I will talk sports betting on tomorrow's podcast as well as the Phoenix Suns. Wednesday, Brandon Marcus, myself, will talk the Cleveland Cavaliers. Thursday, Neil and I would imagine Ethan will talk Bulls. And then Friday, the Atlanta Hawks, Adrian and Coach, will take care of that one. So that's a five worst records in the NBA in reverse order. 
well, worst to fifth worst. <laughs> and uh, we'll just work our way through the whole list over the course of the next six weeks. I'm going to go through that today. What's been going on in the NBA over the weekend? Number one, well, if you go all the way back to Friday, yes, because, you know, we've got a Friday morning podcast, but then you don't hear from us until Monday morning. Friday, the Golden State Warriors knocked off the Houston Rockets on the road. Steph Curry scoreless at halftime, 33 after the break. He went crazy in the second half. Klay Thompson was excellent. No Kevin Durant in that ballgame. No Boogie Cousins. They were the Warriors of old. And they took care of the Houston Rockets, who got a uh, actually a really nice game from Chris Paul. He'd been a little bit quiet in this series so far. He went big. James Harden missed a bunch of free throws in a very weird twist that, I don't know, if he makes more of them, this game perhaps goes to overtime, something like that. I mean, you could always talk about what different teams left out on the table. You know, the Warriors, Draymond Green, Andre Iguodala went 0-4 for 4 at the free throw line. So you, you can't really put it on that. Uh, Warriors just outplayed the Rockets, particularly in the second half. And Houston now with some staring down in the mirror situation going on as Chris Paul gets a year older. And uh, they got to figure out how they're going to try to get up and over the hump. Warriors advance to the conference finals where they will take on the Portland Trailblazers, who won the first of two Game 7s on Mother's Day. By the way, happy Mother's Day to all the moms listening to the podcast or those of you who have mothers listening to the podcast or might be married to a mother pass along our well wishes portland big one from cj mccollum 37 points for cj picked it up for damian lillard who was a total mess in this ball game he shot two for 17 that by the way is not good that's not a good number four three for 17 all right, three for 17. Fine. Regardless, 13, 10, and 8. He ended up with three steals in the ballgame, but he just didn't have it offensively. Portland as a team really didn't have much of it offensively. Evan Turner played well off the bench in his 19 minutes, but it was CJ. 45 minutes. He and Dame both played 45 minutes in this ballgame. Big 37 points. Nikola Jokic, 29 and 13, but only two assists as his teammates went cold, except for, oddly enough, Gary Harris. But Jamal Murray was terrible. 18 shots to get to 17 points. He was uh, on that Damian Lillard kick in this ballgame. Paul Millsap didn't shoot the ball well. He had 10 points on 13 shots and fouled out. And Will Barton just wasn't himself the entire season. He had like two good games. Brutal. I thought Denver was going to win this series. I think we all expected it would go seven. So we got half of that right. And then Portland prevailed, which is kind of cool. And I tweeted it as well. I'm oddly excited about the Blazers winning another series. This is kind of a nice thing because Portland, prior to this season, struck me as a team that was, and I've said this before on the podcast, I thought they were going to suffer from pretty significant stagnation syndrome, which is not a real thing, but something I talk about with teams that don't make many roster moves. And so there just isn't that ray of hope But between Yusuf Nurkic playing better for most of the season before uh, his gruesome injury and Damian Lillard going nuts as per usual, they somehow managed to avoid, they dodged stagnation syndrome. And they had one of their best seasons, and they're having one of their best postseasons. And so what I think you're going to see now is a team that's much more reticent to break things up, because by all accounts, this is a huge success. I still don't know what they do to get over the hump, but at least they say, oh, well, you know, if we have Nurkic back for the end of the regular season and playoffs next year. We'll obviously see how all that goes. Maybe that's our ray of hope. You've seen nice things out of Mo Harkless. He was in foul trouble in this game, but he's been an addition just because he wasn't completely hurt for the entire year. And so, cool. Blazers advance. Nuggets fall. We all figured the Nuggets were going to eventually, you know, they managed to get themselves into a much easier side of the bracket. This is the side of the bracket that didn't have to deal with the Rockets or the Warriors until potentially the conference finals. I thought, I actually thought Oklahoma City was going to be the team that came out of this. Then Portland wiped them out. But at least Portland had home court in that series. They didn't need it. Beat the hell out of them anyway. And uh, they went into Denver and got two in this one. Impressive. Very impressive. A team, Portland winning this ballgame, shooting 41%. Of course, the other side of that equation now is 
could the Blazers ever beat the Warriors shooting 41%? And the answer is a pretty resounding no. When you look at this Warriors-Blazers series, by the way, minus 530 for the Warriors, plus 435 on the Trail Blazers. I only bring that up today because I wanted to throw a couple of thoughts out there on it, and then Neil and I will obviously cover this a little bit more on tomorrow's podcast. You bet these things, this is a series where you, you know, everybody figures the Warriors are going to win it. The reason the number isn't higher is that weird things happen. Guys get hurt. What if Steph Curry goes down? Warriors totally fall apart. They're just, they're not even, they're a good team without him, but they're not even remotely close to great. They're not the Warriors we know right now. So that's why there are these little angles, holes, whatever. But I do think there's something to be said for can the Warriors be caught off guard in this series? And I think the answer to that is yes. I doubt that they take the Blazers as seriously as they did the Rockets. I think you probably see Portland steal a game at some point in this series just to, you know, mess around with the narrative a little bit. Here's what you look at. We all probably figure the Warriors are going to win this series. So the only thing we're hoping for is that the Warriors lose one of the first two games. If they lose the opener, swell. Then you can bet the Warriors after game one. If they lose game two, you could probably bet the Warriors after that one. If they win both of the first two games, you probably just leave this series alone. That's the way I'm looking at it from a betting standpoint. But again, we'll talk more the, uh, about that with the great Neil Rochelani on tomorrow's podcast. Raptors, Kawhi Leonard buzzer beater, knock off the 76ers. We heard rumors over the weekend that Brett Brown might lose his job if they don't make the conference finals, where they didn't, and he hasn't lost his job yet. It would be a very bad firing, a foolish one. But now they've got a lot of questions on their hands. Jimmy Butler's a free agent. Tobias Harris is a free agent. Joel Embiid's body simply can't take an entire NBA season. We saw him breaking down here. And now they run into a Bucks team, uh, the Raptors do, I should say, that turning our attention back to the games that are actually happening. And we'll, don't worry, we'll get to the Sixers post-mortem in a few weeks here. The Bucks are awfully good. I don't know how this is still happening, but I still think Milwaukee is getting underrated. It's a weird concept. By the way, they're minus 275 uh, to go to the finals. Raptors plus 230, the underdog in this series. Milwaukee has home court. Uh, That first game, I believe, is on Wednesday. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong on that. I'm pretty sure that one's a Wednesday start. So here's my thinking on this one. And again, more detail on this on tomorrow's podcast, which will have more of a gambling bent. Milwaukee somehow, despite having the best record in the NBA, was underrated coming into the playoffs. Everybody looked at them as a paper tiger. Hey, you know, a great regular season record, but what have they done in the playoffs? Ah, they won a bunch of home games last year. They got exposed when they played a better team. They're a different monster this year. And they played Detroit in the first round, and obviously that was a cakewalk. And I kept saying, man, I really wish the Pistons would have stolen a game just to create a little bit of vulnerability. And then Milwaukee lost that first game to Boston, and I have to admit, I was shaken. I thought I was wrong all year from that one loss, and so I was, you know, happens to the best of us here, or the worst, get caught up in a little bit of recency bias. And then they came back and they just steamrolled the Celtics. Milwaukee is really, really good. Why are people not believing me, or us, or whoever? So, yes, does Toronto have a chance to win this series? Absolutely, a very good one. That's why they're only plus 230. That's why they're not plus 430 like the the, the Trailblazers are. Is Milwaukee the better team? Yep. Can they do anything about Kawhi Leonard? No, nah, not really. I mean, he's going to go do what he's going to go do. They do have... I mean, they've got rim protection, which Philly also had. I, I mean, the, similar... I don't know that Kawhi is going to see a ton of things from the Bucks that he didn't see from the 76ers, other than to say there's basically someone on Milwaukee they can stick on him all the time that's a better defender. There's never going to be that little opening. Philly had a good set of defensive players, and Kawhi just, I mean, he took like, what, 40 shots in that game yesterday? So if they want him taking 40 shots, fine, so be it. Milwaukee should win this series. I think that they remain underrated. The edge for Toronto is generally older guys. But I don't know. I mean, how does Marcus Gasol fit in this series now? Sure, he can keep up with Brooke Lopez, but does he want to go out to the three-point line on the defensive side? Not really. That opens up the lane quite a bit. 
Boston just sagged back. Al Horford moves better than Marc Gasol. I think you're going to see more Serge Ibaka in this series. We'll see how that all shakes out. Should be a fun one. Should be a fun one. But I do think Milwaukee, even at a decent size favorite, might even be slightly underpriced. Okay, enough of that stuff. These games are going to be fun. That all starts tomorrow. And again, we'll talk to Neil about it on tomorrow's uh, Tuesday show. The Knicks. That's our postmortem today. The New York Knicks. Oh, boy. What do we even say about this? So here's the thing. The way I think we're going to start a lot of these postmortems or season in reviews, whatever you want to call it, is by looking at the contracts that come off the books because things are going to change pretty considerably for a lot of these teams that are just trying to open up salary cap space. I mean, you know, the Knicks purposely loaded up on expiring contracts. It's not, you know, they, they traded away Kristaps Porzingis, Tim Hardaway Jr. They're just, they unburied themselves from the THJ contract. But of course, that means that they ended up with all these weirdos that were awful from a fantasy standpoint, with the exception of Mitchell Robinson. Mitchell Robinson ended up as a top 50 player on the season by average, by the time it was all said and done, and he's signed for less than $2 million for the next three full seasons. Two years and then a team option for the 2021-22 season. The only players that are still getting paid by the Knicks this coming year, 34 roughly million dollars on the books, and I think they've got they have a qualifying offer that could take them up to about 40. Uh, they're going to be paying Joakim Noah for the next three years. They stretched that. Lance Thomas has another year on his deal. That's a weird one. Emmanuel Moutier, restricted free agent. And then you get into basically the young guys. Bas- almost all of them, I think, at this point. Uh, Frank Nilakina, Dennis Smith Jr., Kevin Knox, Alonzo Trier, Damian Dotson, John Jenkins, Jingleheimer Schmidt. <laughs> I don't even know who that is. I'll be honest with you. Henry Ellenson has a team option that he... That, I mean, they might not even pick that up. And then a kid named Billy Garrett. Uh... Perhaps it's more enlightening to discuss the contracts that come off the books. The one-year deal of DeAndre Jordan that they acquired midseason off the books. Ennis Cantor, the player option exercised, that was $18 million. That's off the books. Wesley Matthews, his contract that they picked up from Dallas, ended at the end of this season. By the way, DeAndre Jordan is making $23 million. Cantor, eighteen and a half. Wesley Matthews, eighteen and a half. million. What is that, Sixty? I think it's about $60 million. So that's off the books. Mario Hizonia's one-year, $6.5 million deal is done. Ron Baker's $4.5 million is done. No, Vonley was a very affordable player at 1.6. Maybe they try to bring him back. Luke Cornett is off the books, his 1.6. So the Knicks have all kinds of salary cap space, which we knew because, you know, they're targeting the whole Kevin Durant-Kyrie Irving pairing. But from a personnel standpoint, as we look back at a season gone by and try to predict the future... It's nearly impossible to predict the future. So let's look at what they did this last year. The guys on the Knicks that were actually worth owning in a nine team twelve or a nine category twelve team league. It's a limited number. I would argue three, which I think is probably one higher than a lot of you guys expected me to say. Mitchell Robinson, obvious yes. Top fifty on the season, top thirty. For multiple weeks, he was a top 10 guy for stretches, which is pretty remarkable. So even with all the games at the beginning of the year where he wasn't seeing as much playing time, he still ended up inside the top 50. I have a lot of thoughts on Mitchell Robinson looking towards next year, and so I'll just dump those in here now since there's no right way to do necessarily a postmortem on a team. He's going to get drafted too high. I'm not even going to say that I'm worried he's going to get drafted too high because I know he's going to get drafted too high. What he did, not even necessarily down the stretch, but basically since he came back from his injury when they were traveling abroad. They played the Wizards, as uh, you may recall. Uh, I think that was technically considered a road game in London on January 17th. He had four points, two rebounds, and a block in 10 minutes. His second game back, a home game against the Thunder, 8-6 and six with two blocks. 
His third game back, 12 points with three blocks. His fourth game back, six points, four boards, four blocks. He had at least one block shot in every single game from January 17th until the second to last game of the year. The only game that Mitchell Robinson did not have at least one block between January 17th and the end of the regular season, that's almost three full months of basketball, was against the Pistons on the last day of the year. Which is actually kind of remarkable because the Pistons actually used their big man. So it tells you, by the way, a lot of his blocks coming off the ball. Leaping through the air, fly swatting things. Mitchell Robinson was so unbelievably effective for the last month of the regular season that I've already seen people on Twitter talking about him going in the top 25. Block rates are scary, guys. His is going to be high, but if the Knicks pick up superstars and desperately want to win ballgames, there's a very real chance that they also sign a center to play in front of Mitchell Robinson. Now, we don't know that this is going to be the case, but I'm going to say right now, I'm 99.8 percent sure he's going to get overdrafted which is super sad because I love Mitchell Robinson and you guys know how many times I crowed about him on this podcast early 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 I mean Brew and I were on a show right when he first emerged and Aaron was saying like dump your your fab budget on him and just go for it and then he got hurt Uh, and so there was one league where I had to drop him during that long stretch and that'll hurt me forever uh, but any place where I ended up with him, monster. And you guys know, I, I had talked about it all year, and now I'm telling you the opposite, which you're like, well, what? How can, you, how can you do both? Very easily, because we got him early, the hype picked up, and now the hype has gone nuts. And so now you're going to have to spend too much money, or too, much, too high a pick, whatever, depending on whatever kind of league you're in. If you got pick numbers 24 and 25 in your 12-team league, you're probably not taking Mitchell Robinson. It's just, it's too risky. You can't afford to get uh, a guy who takes a step back or loses playing time to a proven veteran. We'll know more, obviously, about how that is. Yeah, if there's no other centers on the Knicks come fantasy draft time, then maybe some of this changes, but I still don't think I can advocate top 25. The other obvious player on the Knicks, that at least that ended the year on the Knicks, that was worth drafting this last year, was DeAndre Jordan, who I have always avoided. Like the plague. You guys know my take on punting free throw percentage. I don't like it. I won't do it. I feel like I'm getting close to a movie quote. Or no, that's a Dr. Seuss quote. It's, that's uh, Green Eggs and Ham. Anyway, uh, yeah, toddler stuff. So then, all of a sudden this year, DeAndre Jordan fixes his free throw shooting. I mean, legitimately fixed it. He's a career 47, 46 before this year, percent free throw shooter. He had never had a year where he shot better than 58%. That was one time. Which, by the way, it was the previous season. So there were signs of improvement. But over the last two years in a row, he's gone up by 10% in each of them. That's pretty remarkable. He went from 48% two full seasons back to 58% one full season back to 68% with Dallas this most recent year. He actually shot 77% with the Knicks. It all levels out over the long haul. But I think it's fair to say that DeAndre Jordan's probably a 65 to or slightly higher percent free throw shooter now, which pretty dramatically changes his position in fantasy circles. Would I dare risk it? Oh, boy. The answer is probably no, which is not particularly helpful for you. But I'm looking more at a guy like an Andre Drummond, who started off, you may remember this, not this most recent year, but the 27-18 season, he was shooting about 70 to 73% at the free throw line for like two months I forget who the dude was on Twitter that was giving me a hard time. Every every night he had a good foul shooting game. It was it was fun. I'd wake up in the morning to, ah, Dan, five for six last night. And I kept saying, ah, just wait, it'll even out. The thing with guys like DeAndre Jordan and Andre Drummond is they don't even out generally 
the way you'd expect. It's not like when he when you shoot 70%, it's not like he goes 80% one night and then 60% the next. It's like 80, 80, 80, 80, 20. <laughs> so it'll get you when you least expect it. Although, to DeAndre Jordan's credit this year, he really didn't have that many games where he just totally imploded. Golden State game in December, he went 4 for 10 at the free throw line, and then, you know, there's like a smattering of like 3 out of 6s and 4 out of 7s. But he was a fairly consistent 65 to 70% free throw shooter this year. And that's higher than Andre Drummond got. So for all the accolades that Drummond was getting for fixing his foul stroke, which, by the way, is a lot better. You know, he was in the 30s, guys. He was in the 30s. He was a 38% free throw shooter prior to the last two seasons, and then he jumped to 60, and then last year it was 59. So I think with these guys, the question becomes, and you know, we're dabbling in Andre Drummond right now because he's a similar story to DeAndre Jordan. Can we believe what we've seen? And I think with Drummond, the answer is yes. He's now done it two years in a row. He's a 60 percenter, and he's so good in other categories that it actually sort of makes it okay. You're going to have to have two really good free throw shooters on your team just to balance that out, but it's potentially worth it. And with DeAndre Jordan, the age is starting to show itself a little bit. You know, Drummond was born, what, 93? Jordan, 88? So that's a pretty big age gap between the two. DeAndre's into his 30s. The slowdown with Jordan has been a little bit upsetting, and I'm wondering if getting him onto a team that's really making an actual push would kind of wake him back up a little bit. Because defensively, he just wasn't at all the same guy he had been in seasons past. And it's been that way for two years in a row. He, he was that way with the Clippers in his final season where he just totally mailed it in. And then he was that way more or less this most recent year with the Mavericks where they were clearly not trying to win a championship either. And the drop-off has been pretty pronounced. To go from two and a half somewhere between, you know, he even had a 1.7 in there with the Clippers, but it was always 1.7 to 2.5 blocks per game. Suddenly that became one block per game. And the defensive stuff, the rebounding, the defensive stuff, always floated his numbers. And now suddenly this year, he just wasn't that awful in free throw percent. And so all of a sudden you're getting this medium volume 65% field goal guy, but just not blocking shots the way he used to. So do you take a chance on DeAndre Jordan? I think if it falls into that same general area where he ended up this year, which is number 63, yeah, you call him like, what is that? We'll call that like the third tier of centers. You've got the first rounders that are really good at everything. You've got that second big chunk of centers that runs from the, you know, before the trade at least, the Marcus Soles, the... This last year it was DeAndre Ayton, Miles Turner, all those guys drafted in that kind of 25 to 40 whatever range. And then you got into the centers drafted in the 50 to 70 range, which obviously Nick Vucevic, mega overperformance there. Whiteside, big time underperformer. Ennis Cantor was probably drafted in there. Jonas Valanciunas was probably taken in there. DeAndre Jordan falls into that category now, and suddenly he's safer. As a high 60s to 70% free throw shooter, you just don't have to completely retool your team. The question is, if he plays for a team where there's actual pressure on winning, does it all come apart? Does it fall apart between the ears? I don't know. But he could end up being an okay value. Here's why I'm afraid still of DeAndre Jordan. I made all these arguments as to why you can probably draft him in the 60s or 70s and feel okay with yourself. The reason I'm petrified of DeAndre Jordan is that he was always Mr. Durable. You're starting to see a few little cracks on that front. The steals and blocks, not at all where they used to be. And there's still evidence that he could totally fall apart. He had an entire career prior to the last season and a half of not making free throws. So would you risk grabbing him in that area if there's another center available? And so to me, that's why he sort of falls to the end of that third big chunk of centers. He's ahead of a guy like Hassan Whiteside, who may have fallen out of that chunk of centers entirely. Uh, but as you look at the centers drafted, I mean, hell, let's, let's just go back to this most recent season and look at the centers drafted between, say, 50 
and 75. DeAndre Jordan is in there. Uh, Paul Millsap, who has center eligibility, at least on Yahoo. Whiteside, Valanchunas, Brooke Lopez was drafted in there. Julius Randle. Yusuf Nurkic, although he'll go a lot earlier this year. You can even extend it as far as Larry Nance, Serge Ibaka, Steven Adams, potentially. Guys that I think will probably still be in that same area. Do I trust DeAndre Jordan over almost any of those guys? I think I would trust him over Ibaka, although that'll depend on how Toronto's offseason goes. I would probably trust him over Steven Adams, who has not shown any real growth on the free throw shooting side. No, you just, in fact, regression, if anything. He shot only 50% this year. And, you know, his numbers are capped as long as he's playing with Russell Westbrook. I would far prefer to take use of Nurkic, but he'll likely go, uh, well, I mean, obviously the injury stuff, so throw that one out the window. Julius Randle versus DeAndre Jordan. I think it depends highly on what you're looking for, but if indeed Anthony Davis gets traded, Randle could have himself a big-time season. Brooke Lopez? definitely before DeAndre Jordan. Alan Junis, definitely before DeAndre Jordan. So he's more towards the back end of that pack. But he's decidedly in it now. The other problem with DeAndre Jordan is he was getting drafted in that pack even when people thought he couldn't shoot free throws. I don't get this. This is the part that never fully made sense to me. There's a lot of name power with DeAndre Jordan from all the years that he was averaging 15 You know, 13 to 16 rebounds, a steal, and two and a half blocks. I mean, he had a a couple of years in there where he was posting over three defensive stats a game. One, let's see, one, two, three, three years in a row, in fact. He was over three defensive stats per game. So even though he wasn't hitting free throws, the field goal percentage number was crazy high. The defensive numbers were crazy high. He was basically like Andre Drummond before Andre got his free throw percentage up into the 50s and 60s. And so everybody was like, oh, DeAndre Jordan, you you lock up rebounds and blocks and field goal percent with one pick. He's not that guy anymore. Not playing with Chris Paul, you know, for all the warts with with CP3, he's an insufferable player to watch on a basketball court. He got DeAndre Jordan a lot of very easy buckets. So it's not a surprise that his field goal percentage, since Paul was no longer his running mate, has dropped from 70 to 63 yeah, we're complaining about 63. This is all comparative analysis. So the field goal percentage down, 6 to 7%. The rebounding is always going to be pretty good as long as he's on the floor for 31 minutes. He's going to grab a lot of rebounds. Uh, but the blocks are down around one per game. The steals are down to about half per game. So his defensive stats have basically cut in half. He's probably going to get drafted in that 50 to 75 range anyway. So does that mean you're going to end up with him now? P- probably not. The argument here is, at least now, if he falls to where you are, you could probably grab him and say, you know what, at least I'm not punting something anymore. I'd love, by the way, for that to be the end of our Knicks analysis on this team, but I do want to talk about just a couple other players very quickly. One of them is Noah Vonley, who did have stretches this year where he was a very useful fantasy player. He's a top 100 guy for a couple months in a row. And then as a lot of players with this Knicks team, his minutes started getting yanked around considerably. I mean, they're at a stretch from November to basically the month of November. He played 30 minutes a game. And then uh, for December, he was around that same mark. Then January came down. Then the end of January and the mid of February was back up again. You just, you had no idea what he was going to be getting on a night-to-night basis. If you could safely say Noah Vonley was going to play 28 minutes to 32 minutes on a night, yeah, he was a useful top 100 guy. But then, I mean, let's let's just pick an arbitrary date. The, the end of January. Let's look at February and March. And he didn't play the last three weeks of the year either. February and March, his minutes were uh, erratic. 31, 24, 21, 3, 25, 17, 18, 16, 25, 18, 11, 22, 28, 33. Oh, look at that. 31, 28, 33, 8. Can't trust a guy like that. I don't know where he's going to end up next year, but he has proven himself that if he gets the 30 minutes, he was passing a little bit 
for the Knicks this year. He had a nine assist ball game. He had a seven assist ball game blended in there. He was actually getting some steals and blocks, which wasn't really his MO in seasons past. He's always been a solid rebounder. He added the three point shot to his game. He had put himself into a spot where he could have fantasy value, but they just didn't give him the, the minutes to do it. And now the other side of the coin on the Knicks, as we move along from Milvon Lake, because again, we don't know where he's going to end up. Guys that we know are going to be on the Knicks that are always going to be drafted that shouldn't be. Emmanuel Moutier, Dennis Smith Jr., Kevin Knox. These guys were atrocious. Moutier, 213. Smith, 217. Knox, number 299 in 9 cat. You're like, well, what if they played more minutes? It doesn't matter. These dudes averaged 27, 28, and 29 minutes a game, respectively, and couldn't crack the top 210. That's brutal. Those guys have almost an immeasurable distance to go to get to a point where they can have fantasy value. We always talk about points leagues guy. Those are the guys that are points leagues guy because Moutier can't do the percentages. Dennis Smith Jr. can't do the percentages. Kevin Knox shot 37% this year and has no defensive stats. If you can rely exclusively on scoring and percentages don't matter, fine. But if you're in a normal category-based league, get out. And finally, the last name I want to mention here on our Knicks postmortem before we wrap this thing up is Mario Hazonia, who briefly saw enough minutes to be productive. And when I say briefly, I mean very briefly. He had one game in October where he logged 30 minutes. He had one game in November where he logged 30 minutes, and he was very good, by the way, in both of those. He had zero games in December where he logged 30 minutes. There were a couple in January. There were a few in February. He got kind of a look in March. He had that 29-point game. uh, Or sorry, that was actually the first game of April. Get my calendar right. He was very good for uh, basically the last week and a half of the regular season, playing for his next contract. I don't know. You're going to have to gauge it. I mean, if we think that he's going to go get a starting job somewhere, he could end up being kind of your weird little sleeper pick because his steal rate is pretty good. Uh, He rebounds fairly well. He's a taller guy than people realize. He's like 6'9". He's not a good basketball player, but if he ends up on a team that stinks, like the Knicks, that isn't so worried about yanking him around, keep an eye on where Mario Hazonia ends up. He's shown himself, despite being number 276 this year, uh, again, a lot of that is just inconsistencies he could be he could be I say this very loosely he could be useful Um, he can't shoot 41 percent and be useful he needs to get his free throw percentage back up into the 80s where it was in Orlando Uh, but if you see his minutes climbing up towards 30 and maybe the shot selection not so horrible he's a guy to keep an eye on as an outside whatever All right, that's postmortem number one. Tomorrow, Neil Rochelani will join me as a co-host on the pod. We'll talk betting, the two remaining series. What do we learn from uh, the last couple? We might even get into the individual games. And then postmortem number two, the Phoenix Suns. That should be a fun one, actually. I got a lot of thoughts on the Phoenix Suns. This Fantasy NBA Today, a hoop ball presentation, also brought to you by our title sponsors, Hawaiian Isles Kona Coffee. I am Dan Vespers, at Dan Vespers on Twitter at Hoop Ball Fantasy, at H.I. Kona Coffee. Have a lovely Monday, everyone. No basketball tonight, so watch some baseball. So long. This has been a Hoop Ball presentation.